Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Insomnia True Silver Championship 2nd Edition. My name is Nimsh, and I'm here with Solo, and I want to welcome Firebat to the couch, <laughs> previous world champion 2014, the conqueror of Infinity Tournaments, and a um, gentleman. Wow, gentleman. Thanks. That was a beautiful introduction. I'm really happy to be here. I haven't casted in quite a while, so it might be a little rusty, so hopefully Twitch check goes a little easy on me, but hopefully I can bring some insight. As I was a player in this tournament, I've been through like the Swiss fortune and all of that, so shed some light on things maybe. I don't Absolutely. Know. I hope you will, because my first question would be, how did you enjoy the first day, the Swiss part, with 103 people? Like You did face Dog in the first round. Yeah, facing Dog in the first round was pretty brutal. <laughs> He's uh, definitely a tough opponent and a good friend, so like coming up against him, knowing one of us is going to have a really hard time, especially with tiebreakers later on, with how that works with Swiss, was uh, pretty brutal. And then I lost that game immediately, so I knew my tiebreakers were going to be weak, so I had to perform the rest of the day. But uh, I tried to really just keep a positive attitude and really just try and hammer through it. I was, If you follow my Twitter or anything, I was just constantly tweeting about just staying amped and ready to go and just expecting to play until 2 in the morning and being excited about it. I think you really need that. Yeah, definitely. And it's Solo, what do you think? Um, because Dog won versus James in the first round, and now he's in the final. Um, <laughs> so how, how did, did that work? I mean, it was it was a clash of the titans in round one, right? So, you know, as, as he pointed out, one of them was going to have a hard time. Going 0-1 is, you know, people say, sure, you can just go 5-1, 6-0 from that spot and still be in a good place. But the effect it has in your tiebreakers overall is so huge. But you know, being the winner from that position puts you in such a great spot going forward, having already put yourself in the upper part of the bracket. So, you know, maybe in a different world, we would be uh, watching Firebat sitting in grand finals <laughs> right now. But instead, he's here hanging out with us, and I'm glad to have him here. So. Absolutely. And talking about hanging out, like, you got eliminated day one, but day two, what were you doing? This is Insomnia, a big LAN. Well, I wasn't doing anything too interesting most of the day, actually. I was uh, participating in Open Cups. Uh, just trying to grind and get those BlizzCon points has been a big priority for me. That's one of the main reasons I'm here is just the opportunity to get BlizzCon points. Not to mention I know pretty much everybody here, so <laughs> being able to hang out with friends is awesome. So just grinding open tournaments in the computer area with everybody else and hanging out, talking with people. I had a really good time. All right, and uh, we touched upon the dog being in the final. Let's look at the standings at the very moment. The today's bracket, uh, we are playing single elimination, best of five, uh, last year's standing, and we already have one finalist. Uh, right now, we are standing in front of a second semi-final, Ness versus Kamlan. So, guys, have you played versus them? Like, so I asked you many time, times to talk about Ness, but Firebat, what do you know about this guy? Uh, I don't really know anything about Ness at all. This is the first time I've actually seen him play, but uh, Kalman, I saw him play in WCA. I, I competed there with him, and uh, he played very solidly in WCA, so um, it makes sense that if you see him continually doing well. Absolutely. And so, anything to add about Ness? Like, how does Ness... Uh, have you talked to him before this match specifically versus Kamlan? I have, ready? yeah. We, we were backstage. We were watching the, the semi-final between Pokrovac and Kamlan. Just, you know, as the UK representative, it's in my interest, of course, to, like, support him. So we were doing some, some pick strategies and working out, like, matchups and what he has to watch out for. And um, honestly, he, we, he and we feel very comfortable about his matchup against whichever of the two guys he played. Uh, I think his strange choice, if you like, to bring Priest actually lines him up quite well. We're against uh, Patron and the aggressive Warlock. There was a there's, there's a real Zoo, and then there's that kind of weird lock with Zoo and burst damage at the end as well. So Priest is positioned quite well against both of those, and obviously effective against Patron as well. So he's feeling pretty confident. He's saying that his his biggest obstacle overall is just making sure that the nerves don't hit him again because he's starting to get more experienced under the lights on the live stage now. But he's pretty much only experienced it here at Insomnia in the, the previous year and now this year. So it's limited experience, but it's something he's getting more and more comfortable with. So it can still hit him at weird times, he was saying. So he's just going to try and stay focused, slow down, stay calm, and just make sure he makes the right plays, thinks everything through. Absolutely. For, for both Ness and Kamlan, this is their big day. They can be the champion today at Insomnia, but we actually talked to them uh, yesterday. So let's see what they have to say for themselves. really happy that I got through to top eight. Just like last time when I made it, I was exhilarated. Competition's been really tough. The biggest challenge for me was playing on stage for the first round. So I had to play against Soleil on stream and I knew his lineup was favored against mine. And the pressure of being on stage as well, it kind of gets to me sometimes. My mindset for going into top eight is to just keep calm, keep trying my best, think about what my opponent will play first and try and predict the right one and pick the right deck. 
to my opponents, you might not have known who I was before, but hopefully you know who I am now after some good performances. You might think Priest is an awful class, but I think it's good, and I'm ready to show you that it can beat your lineup. My name is Kemlan, and I play for Flow Esports. I think the level of competition in this tournament is very high, very high. Um, I'm used to play like uh, online tournaments, but here are so many big names. I think I have kind of good chances because I feel like my lineup is very strong. I managed to draw good as Druid <laughs> and Patron did well. So like the lineup, I'm pretty confident in the lineup. It feels really good to be a top eight because I'm not used to uh, competing on stage. I wasn't really expecting it. All right, so both players are actually mentioning lineups, and uh, for the viewers, they mostly see the game after game after game. Um, far about how important is the lineup, and how do you do you prepare your lineup for this kind of tournament? The lineup's the most important part, by far. Like preparation and trying to figure out the lineup that's going to be the most successful is the hardest thing, and it's really what's going to determine who's going to do all right in the tournament and who's going to win the tournament. Like it really separates the good players from the exceptional players. And we see here with Kalman bringing the sort of hybrid Warlock, and we see here with Ness bringing the Priest, some like interesting tech choices in both of these decks, and it's really what's separating them from the rest of the pack and why they're here. Definitely. So anything to add about the lineups for those guys? Uh, no, I mean, the, as we talked about, the, the Priest is going to be crucial. Basically, the other thing that, that I spoke about with Ness is that he just has to find a way to beat the Druid. The Druid is the problem now. For example, his Priest build doesn't have uh, Injured Blademaster in it, so that's a very weak matchup against Druid overall. It's, he kind of is forced to play from behind all the time. He doesn't have that chance to get the initiative. So he's going to have to find a way to, to beat Druid, and that may just be with the Druid Mirror being his best chance, since his Warlock is not the quick zoo that we're used to. It has all that extra late game stuff at the end as well. So, um, you know, that's going to be the big hurdle. If, if Kamlan wins this, it might be with a Druid 3-0. But apart from that, I know Ness is feeling very, very comfortable in his lineup. So what do you start with, Firebat, from both sides? What do you start with from both sides? Well, if Coleman feels like his Druid's not going to be answered, then might as well start with the Druid. Just do as much damage as you can immediately with the Druid. That's what I would do in Coleman's position. And I think from Ness's side, he's got to be expecting that, right? So he's got to think, what's my best chances against the Druid? I guess I'll take the 50-50 Druid Mirror. But then there may be some mind games there, because now what if Coleman's like, well, he thinks I'm going to start with my Druid because that's the best deck I can start with. So let's start with the Zoo then. So he goes Druid, I go the Zoo and get a favorable matchup there. So it's really depends how you want to weigh that coin and how you get the read on your opponent and their confidence level. And what, what if Nas goes even further beyond it? Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm saying, yeah. So. You can go as deep as you want to go, but at the end of the day, like, it's either a read or a 50-50. You got to look at it one of those two ways. And, or you can do the safe pick, right? The sacrifice play in last year's standing. So you throw out your deck you think is going right. to do the least in the series. Maybe it's patron because you think it's just going to auto lose to priest and then uh, have it thrown away, but. Now we see Coleman here leading with the Druid, which I think is pretty expected since it just does all right against everything. Yeah. And Ness going with the Warlock. Yeah, and this, this Warlock deck, although it has a lot of Zooey cards in it, it doesn't have that consistency to really beat down Druid early. It does suffer with some clunkier draws. You can see here, Healbot, Double Dart Bomb, Abusive Sergeant in hand, not a collection of cards that's going to steamroll Druid early. So although, you know, historically these kind of board-focused Warlock decks tend to do fantastically against Druid, this build is just a little bit slower, suffers against Druid. Ness said that he wasn't overly confident. Feels like his best chance of beating Druid is just the 50-50 Druid mirror. And we've seen the guy draw Innovate Emperor three games out of three in the last <laughs> series. So yeah. he probably does feel pretty good in a Druid mirror. Yeah. Definitely. And before we start discussing the hands, I also want to add that uh, those guys have uh, 2,500 guaranteed at the very moment. And they play to double the money. Whoever goes to the final will have uh, 5,000 guaranteed at least and 10,000 prize pool. Plus, uh, if I about mentioned the HCT points, they have five points guaranteed at the moment, and they can double the points going into the final, and then the final is getting 15. Yeah, you want to get about 13 for to get into the prelims, total points. So getting 10 points gets you means you only have to hit Legend each of the seasons. So if you're getting 10 points, you're pretty much guaranteed in the prelims. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, so back to the game, guys. The hands um, for, for them, the starting hands. Wild growth for the Druid seems pretty good. One of the win conditions for Ness here, honestly, is just the Druid drawing bad. Like, the Druid right. is a high variance deck. It runs double combo. It has tons of potential to just fizzle out. But uh, Coleman's hand doesn't look like it's fizzling out. It's got off to like a kind of a rocky start, but it looks good enough. 
right? And if anyone's fizzling out here, it's Ness straight away. He did get that turn one zombie chow, but he, he'd love to have gone, you know, chow into peddler, into imp gang boss, emulate the zoo experience for the druid, but he uh, is missing all those extra cards like the jugglers and haunted creepers that really just any combination of cards zoo draws is usually going to be able to pressure druid pretty well, but Ness just doesn't have that in his deck. He's favoring that more late game approach. He also has like the void callers, right? Mulganis. Yep. Right. Yeah. Those are pretty huge too. If you can get a Void Caller down and it doesn't get silenced, you can get like anything out, even like an Imp Gang boss. Like that's still a solid net gain of just tempo on the board. And Druid has a really hard time recovering. So those sort of tempo swings are really what you're looking for. Emulating the zoo. That's yeah. <laughs> just the zoo, yeah, I, I heard <laughs> Sato said that, that was funny. The, the zoo experience, just give it all. It's the new theme park ride. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what it sounds like. Experience. The zoo ride. Trying to bathe in the zoo spirit. Yeah. In a way. Um, so, how do we feel about uh, Tempo Big Game Hunter this turn? Because passing a free turn into five mana to Druid does not feel great. And loading up that Big Game Hunter on the board does give you an option to just play one of your removal spells next turn to trade up into an expected Druid of the Claw from your opponent. Not terrible, I think, overall. I don't know. I'm, I'm more favor the tap. Like, you have such a good defensive hand here. You got double Dark Bomb, you got Hellfire, and you have Shadow Flame. So, like, sure. your board recovery and your mechanisms to get back on the board are just huge. So I think you just want to kind of tap, let your opponent develop a board, and then try and recover with a big swing turn. So how important is it for Ness to pressure overall? Like, if he goes into defensive mode, he doesn't have the combo himself, right? Like, he will try to develop the board anyway and be able to uh, defend against the Druid. Yeah, Ness's deck needs to win on the board. Yeah. So I think if he, if he waits too long, there's kind of that inevitability when you play against Druid. Like, at some point, they're just going to draw critical mass. If you wait too long, there's, they're just going to, like, double combo you with Innovate because you've let them draw you draw their whole deck. So. At some point, he's going to have to find some way to pressure, but I agree with Firebat in the sense that he still does have time. It's not catastrophic yet to play from behind for a few more turns. So the tap did get him into that boy caller. If he's able to get close to a big demon at some point now, then he'll be looking in decent shape. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, like your game plan against Druid can be like, oh, maybe they don't find Ancient Allure. Because like, right. if Druid doesn't find Ancient Allure, sometimes they just run out of cards yeah. and just have hero power pass turns basically later on in the game. So grind, in, grind them down and uh, play yeah. War of Attrition. Yeah. Ram Bronzebeard will be quite nice with that Dark Peddler. Yeah, but the question is, maybe you even just play the Dark Peddler here. Right. He's definitely considering it, whether he to use that coin now uh, just to get the Peddler out on the board, get a 2-2 as a platform that he can build from. Yeah. But um, with the draw of the brand, that might just make his greedy eyes light up and he just can get the double value off that Peddler later. Yeah, he's thinking about Emperor Thorson definitely coming down. He's like, how do I kill Emperor Thorson if it comes down? If Emperor Thorson comes down and I don't have this Peddler on the field, I'm like Dark Bomb coin hell firing, and that feels awful. So if you have the Dark Peddler down, though, then you can trade in the 2-2, play Bran, Dark Bomb the Emperor Thorson. Sure, so. Ness definitely taking this one all the way to the rope, does decide yeah. to hold on to it, so he is going to hope that there is no Emperor Thorson on this turn. Good news is there isn't, but yeah. still a decent proactive play from Kamlan's side, able to develop the Druid of the Claw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like taking the risk there on it. I think more often than not, your opponent's not going to have Emperor Thorson, and you need to be as greedy as you can in an unfavored matchup. Right. Definitely, yeah, take the risks. So Drew the Claw comes down in taunt mode, still pretty dominant on this board, but now Ness is starting to develop a few options in his hand. Still not the most explosive hand, but he does have a ton of options, able to pick up a bunch more from this Dark Peddler play if he's going to go with the Bran line here. Still no demon, though. Nope. Is this Bran Dark Peddler the best play here? Because it's obviously just uh, stands out as uh, drawing two cards. Yeah, I mean, the downside is that in every world you sacrifice your brand immediately. It's not going to be able to get long-term value for, say, that Defender of Argus to come down and really crush the game out. But he just needs to make something happen here because uh, he's he's playing from behind and if he knows that turn seven is incoming from Druid, so he can't afford to wait much longer. He needs to start fighting right now. Void Walker is interesting here because you can protect your brand in a way. Like, P.O. stands out as the, the card you want to take because it's uh, versus Druid. But uh, Void Walker, if you are able to protect it, maybe oh, corruption yeah. corruption. interesting choice i was thinking maybe po to go with the shadow flame it's interesting maybe he's thinking about coining the corruption this turn yeah, that's interesting i mean i think all of those were viable the reasoning that nimsh gave for for void walker there makes a lot of sense power overwhelming this i spot that as well just goes great with that shadow flame that he has but yeah just corruption no real huge value trade on the board for this four six so it's going to do its work taking out bran and then uh, suffer the fate of the the corrupted bear here and just uh, melt away into the ether, leaving that 2-2 hopefully alone on the board from Ness's perspective. And for yeah, I mean, it's like a soul fire with no downside there. That's sure. actually yeah, yeah, yeah. really solid, and the corruption puts in a lot of work. Yeah, good pick there by Ness. And for Kamala, it seems like Ancient of Lore is the play. 
There's yeah. no way for now to save the bear from dying. Yeah, like Ancient Allure is really good here, but at the same time, you don't feel that great about it because you're not really developing that much on the board. Like, yeah. sure, you're getting a 5-5, five five, but mainly you're refilling your hand with this play. Whispers of the Old Gods is not out yet, and we already have corrupted minions on board. <laughs> That's true. We too have corrupted minions. Lesson one, Fireback, don't human imp by laughing. It just, it, just, it just makes him work. You just end up with more jokes. Well, no, he like turned and looked at me like he was going to say something really serious and then said it. So like the rest of the audience can't see his comedic timing, but it was okay. very well done. It's all, all right. about delivery, right? Yeah, nice. the delivery was very nice. All right. Uh, Sylvanas drawn, but just a 5-5 five -five against a 5-5 five -five right now. He's going to be wanting to get better value out of it than that. Still no demon in hand for no, the Dark Peddler. The flame imp. Oh, yeah, it does have the Flame Imp. Yeah, my bad. Yeah. Picked it off the, the Dark Peddler. So, yeah, Void Caller onto the board here. Just decent representative piloted Shredder type minion right now. A 3-4 with a 3-2 inside it. Not bad at all. Yeah. What do you guys think about Ancient of War for Kamlin? I mean, what else does he do? Right. <laughs> no, like, no, like, like as a play, but uh, as, a, as a deck choice. Uh, oh, as a deck choice, okay. As a deck choice, I think it's very good. I think it really helps the Druid Mirror a lot. Like, the Druid Mirror is one of the most common matchups that happened in this tournament, especially in the Swiss format. And if you play Ancient of War and they silence it, which is generally speaking the worst case, because I don't think a single player had Black Knight, it's still a 5-5. Five -five, and uh, you played a 2-4, so <laughs> it's not good for you. So. Yeah, it's definitely a powerful card. To include. Dude, I haven't got an Ancient of War Black Knighted in about 18 months, but it is the single worst feeling in all of Hearthstone. It's yeah. disgusting. Just wait for standard. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. coming back. <laughs> Black Knight is already there waiting. Yeah, so hides the living roots here behind the Ancient of War, which makes a lot of sense when you have Double Savage Roar in your hand, just hoping he can uh, ride this minion presence to the bank. Double Savage Roar and Swipe is playable next turn, so that's actually a ton of damage building up here. Yeah, I mean, Ness has got to be really scared of just combo. Right. Combo's 27, right, with the uh, two living roots and the war, so. Yep. Threatening lethal with combo potentially doesn't actually have combo. How much damage does he actually have? He's got 8, 16, 17, 18, plus 5, plus 4. 27, uh, right? 27, yeah. Ah, 27 both ways with nice. the, the <laughs> double roar innervate swipe, so. He's threatening lethal with combo and threatening lethal with the other way. No, it's not really a bluff. Right, so Ness does actually have to find a solution yeah. here to, to play around this. I mean, he may be tempted just to develop Sylvanas because it's a it's a pretty fantastic play on this board against the 510, but he does uh, choose to respect the threat of combo. He can look at his opponent's hand as well. Those two Savage Roars have been hung around for a while, so it's easy from his perspective to give those two Savage Roars credit as being the two combo cards right now. So. I think um, reasonable expectation to play around combo here. Basically, whenever you see Druids play Living Roots as the small minions, you have to suspect something. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're taking a risk while they're doing that. So yeah, it's usually for some sort of payout. And a bluff here doesn't seem like it would make that much sense. But I mean, yeah. This Emperor, though, that is some <laughs> when your Emperor Thorson hits two Savage Roars, that usually allows you to have some pretty flexible lethals coming up. So. It's just the question of maybe do you use the Innervate with it or do you just play the Shade? How much do you want to commit? Yeah, I think the the how much to commit is the big issue here because you know Cam Camlan will have done his research now, so this deck will have caught a few people by surprise during this tournament. But I'm sure Camlan's gone back, watched everything that he has available to him, so he will have seen that there are multiple AOE options available in this deck for Ness, both of them in hand right now, Hellfire and Shadow Flame. So he'll just be wondering exactly what the right amount of dudes to commit to the board right now is. There's also an interesting interaction because Ness played uh, Flame Imp as the only demon in his hand, but after seeing Flame Imp being Camlan thing like hey just uh, play the right. that demon and he has Mulganis probably or something bigger in hand yeah mm -hmm. that makes sense well he's got another demon now but not quite Mulganis just a, a little bit weaker <laughs> so can you find a good hellfire here or do you go for a, a shadow flame in a way well you can clear the board with hellfire right you trade in the zombie chow and the flame imp hellfire and then trade in the uh, the three Power. one into the emperor yeah. Thorsen. Yep, and that gets you an Imp Gang boss on board. You have uh, four mana left over to spend, which is only really Defender of Argus, which doesn't feel great. So, um, But this board does need addressing. I mean, that Emperor Thorazan in particular needs addressing, but just the, the any minion to an extent needs to be dealt with here because it's just threatening to compound the combo damage. Yeah, and I mean, you're even afraid of double combo now because Emperor Thorazan's gone off from Druid. Exactly. And he's been holding all three of the cards on the left side of his hand the entire game, basically. I think it's actually quite decent if you look at it, uh, getting a 3-5 taunt and a 2-3 on board after clearing it. 
right? I just feel like just, you know, rationing out his defensive cards. He'll want to try and hit two two taunts with that Argus if possible, but I guess he just feels desperate enough that, you know, he just wants to take the board presence right now, and it does make a lot of sense. And this is something that can happen to Druid, believe yeah. it or not. Sometimes they get a handful of cards that don't actually do anything, and just the art of playing a few dudes and overrunning them just come, just takes the game away. Yeah, I was uh, touching on this a little bit at the beginning of the game. I was like, one of Ness's win conditions here is just Kalman drawing garbage with right. Druid. That <laughs> yeah. happens. Like, Druid is... People say it's so strong and so powerful, but at the same time, it just sometimes can have no leg to stand on in the middle of the game. Well, you're saying that, but if he gets Force of Nature, he can actually... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just turns into everything. Yeah, yeah. The whole game will turn around with one draw. So, those combos, man. Yeah, I mean, the one useful card in this hand right now is the swipe. Allows him to answer this Imgang boss pretty efficiently. Just a 1-1-1 one, one, one going to be left over on the board. But he's actually even going to turn that down. Potentially uh, looking for more value from the swipe or just using it to max out on burst damage if he draws uh, other cards like possibly Druid of the Claw. Does that let him have lethal on the following turn? Well, if there's only one minion charging, then Savage Roar is four damage. Mm -hmm. So it's only 12. Right. I have no interesting. Time for games. Huh. Why would you turn down the opportunity to swipe there? Concealing the swipe, possibly, to not pay even more taunts. Be like, hey, yeah, I can. He can like if he gets force of nature, he can always swipe this board. Yeah, maybe it's some sort of stealth tactic. Does he have lethal with force of nature? He must have. Yeah. With force, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. So some sort of like conceal, because like right now Ness is like, all right, double combo doesn't kill me, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's got the taunt there, so Coleman's like, that's my only out to win. I'm gonna hide it and make sure he doesn't have any taunts, so he takes a greedier line. Sure. All right. I'm on board. Uh, but. Tannis' Aspirant, again, sometimes you just draw River Crocolisk off the top of your deck. It <laughs> happens. Yeah, it was really bad for him. So is he going to continue uh, with the same line of play and continue concealing the swipe here? Or? I don't think there's a lot else that you can do. Um, Fiber, I was, I was referencing you earlier when you explained your reasoning when you first cut Tannis' Aspirant from the deck, and you said that it's, it's great as a surprise card, so once it's been out of the meta for a while and people stop learning how to deal with it, you can then bring it back in and you can potentially just like crush one tournament. Yeah, yeah we've seen a bunch of Aspirant in this tournament. Do you feel like the time is right for it to have come back in? Or? Yeah, I think right now is a pretty solid time for Aspirant. A lot of people have been mulliganing away ways to deal with it. I don't think it's very good against Control Warrior, though, which is one thing. But I think it's pretty good against Paladin and things like this. But I don't know. I don't think people are that surprised by it, but they're kind of surprised by right. it. I think it's more... Oh my god, Aspirant, what? <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like that. It's like kind of like half people play it, half people don't. Like, it never really got to the point where no one was playing Aspirant. Right, yeah, I agree. Which is when it gets really crazy. If no one plays it and then you suddenly bring it back, it's insane. But, yeah, people have been still expecting it. Jaraxxus, by the way, being drawn by Ness. Uh, you can't really play it. <laughs> I mean... Or can you? Sure. It's like, how big is the difference between 17 and 15? It's pretty huge, because if one combo is discounted, you know, if, if there's just like one Savage Raw sit in the hand, he draws Force of Nature, he's probably able to hero power with it. That's the 15 that he needs. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's probably going to have to life tap this turn either way if he doesn't play Jaraxxus. So that's the rationale he has to go through here. Like, what's the difference between 17 and 15? What does that mean to me? How important is that? Also, Offset that about against how quickly Jaraxxus can win the game and go from there. Remember what information Ness has at the moment. There were like five cards, six right. cards for uh, Kamlin, and he only play, played Aspirin. Yeah, what, does, yeah. what does it tell you? Yeah, you're definitely scared. I like the tap a lot, though. Tap gets you closer to heals. It gets you closer to taunts, which are going to be pretty relevant, and it doesn't really increase your clock that much. And I love jamming everything on the board right oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sets up lethal with abusive Sergeant Jaraxxus from this point, so uh, this is pretty insane. Even if so, he hero powers the owl, he's going to be at 13, 9 on board, 11. Four. He's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Yeah, he's so. dead. Wow. Yeah, and definitely this, solid. This was the so bad matchup. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> that was the correct play for sure. Yep. So Absolutely. He took Kelman his still just drew nothing. So this is exactly what, what you said, Firebat. He, he did get the combo parts, but not the most important one, which is Force of Nature. And he ripped Innervate into Innervate with nothing in his hand. <laughs> like, <laughs> innervate into Innervate into River Crocolisk. Like, that's not really the draw that you want in that kind of situation. This is such an important win as well, because we mentioned that uh, he can free all with Druid. Yeah. But Druid is now out. Right. So that's yeah. the, hu the biggest threat for Ness was Kalman's Druid, yep. and then Kalman's Druid just whiffs. Absolutely. And, uh, 
Ness wins this game, kills the Druid, stays with the Warlock, and Kamlan needs to find a deck to be able to defeat that. Right, and it's absolutely a thing that can happen with Druid. It's kind of the, the price of admission that you have to pay for having all these powerful effects in your deck, the Innovates, the Wild Gross, that huge burst damage combo at the end. The price you pay for having those ridiculously powerful things in your deck is that if you draw them at any point except the exact right time for them, they're just terrible, useless cards. Even Darnus' surprise didn't help. Right, <laughs> Darnus' <laughs> surprise. Turn 10 Darnus' surprise. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I would, be, I would be surprised, like, as Ness, just my opponent has six cards in hand, plays Darnus' and passes. I'm like, <laughs> what? What do you have? All right, so this is a matchup that I've been looking forward to. The Battle of the Weird Locks. Like Ness's version with the, just the, the mid-range Warlock, pure and simple, just curving out all the way up to the big, powerful Warlock legendaries. And then Kamlan's version, slightly different, like Burst Warlock, um, you know, Combo Warlock, just early game zoo cards, and then draw and survival in the mid-game into big burst combos with Leroy and Soulfire, Power Overwhelming, Dart Bomb, whatever whatever massive damage you can gather together in your hand. And mid-range minions. And, yeah. and some dudes in the middle, yeah. yeah. Shredder and Azurdrake. Yep. Oh, that's a good opening for, for Ness. Yeah, Ness has a crazy opening hand. Omen's opening hand, not as exceptional. He missed, like, the Lepronomes and the things that this deck really looks for. Right. Yeah, Beast of Sergeant doesn't seem ideal against the Zombie Chow. No Mortal Coil or any such thing in hand. Dart Peddler, pretty much the same problem. So he may Please just have dark to bomb? point out the Dart Bomb yeah. here on the Zombie Chow and just go from Peddler next turn. I, I think it's the play, actually, because... Um, and what about Pass? Pass is an option, I guess. Um, from the Zoo perspective, I'd probably want to... Like, if I was playing against Zoo, I'd probably want to coin Dart Bomb his one drop because if I don't do it, I'm always one minion behind when I start developing, right? But against this deck, it's slower, so you don't expect them to have a two drop all the time. So yeah. it's probably more forgivable to pass overall. I think I like the Dark Bomb. You need to grab the initiative. It's kind of like a zoo versus zoo, for, for the moment at least. And just snags another zombie chow. Seems good in this situation. <laughs> Fighting for early ball control. Gets another one mana, two, three. Everyone's still at 30 health. So that's a pretty stellar card right now. Dark Bomb again. <laughs> <laughs> to, set, to set dominance. Whatever you play at Dark Bomb, it. Nah, I think I just have to respond with Dark Peddler of your own. Yeah, this doesn't seem to be very much choice. Dark Bomb face. Awful. <laughs> yeah, Dark Bomb fence, start the burn now. I mean, you play Leroy in your deck, right? You gotta start dealing damage at some point. Absolutely. Um, is Flame Imp the best here? Yeah, you can Flame Imp Dark Bomb the next minion that comes out. So Quite nice. Yeah, seems reasonable. Uh, Otherwise, I mean, you just have like no solid dudes to play. Right. You gotta get dudes before you can burn face. Yep, um, from Ness's perspective, he has a decent turn here. Uh, just He can just trade the Peddlers, develop two more minions of his own, pick up another Peddler card as long as as well as getting the Zombie Chow on the board. So he's uh, starting to progress along quite nicely here, but they both have, uh, once they've navigated these early turns, they both have a couple of uh, decent mid-range minions in their hand as well. All right, so another Peddler and the Flame Imp as well. But PO is something you need to consider. Especially when you go uh, against a deck with Fazer Drakes and Pilot Shredder, you might need it at some point. Sure, but PO can only be really used if you're able to have the board, and I guess he's not too confident in his ability to keep the board with the minions he has in hand. I don't know, though, with Argus coming out next turn. Yeah. Wouldn't be bad, but Flame Imp is definitely a solid pick as well. For sure. Implosion, a quite nice uh, of a card for turn four. Yeah, the creator of this, uh, I don't remember the name, the guy that made the uh, hybrid lock, but... X said, something? Yeah, it's like X something, yeah. There's like a C in there somewhere. Yeah, it's like <laughs> there's, X, there's some letters. I, oh, Z, right. yeah. something like that, yeah. He said the, the most important card is Implosion, and he almost keeps it in every matchup. Oh, damn. So... I actually have a PSA for all the deck creators out there. If you, if you want to be famous as a deck creator, name yourself like John or... Yeah, yeah, something Dave. that people can remember. <laughs> Like, I feel bad that I don't remember his name. I was looking at this deck earlier because I saw it and it was, it was interesting to me. Definitely. Yeah. And yep. it worked for Kamlan. Like, he is right now in the top right. four. Yeah, and Flame Imp Dart Bomb, as predicted by Firebat, does come down, able to make a little bit of a swing on the ball, but that Peddler is still there to trade out with the Flame Imp. But nothing too proactive this turn from Ness, so he may just, yeah, develop the Dart Bomb and Abusive Sergeant onto the board as well. Looks like it's coming down as well as the Flame Imp. This is uh, ambitious. I think this is quite good overall because uh, he has the, mini the minions and uh, he's playing versus Zodek specifically. Like, he has more end game. So as long as he um, survives still the long game, he will have better minions overall. Yeah, Ness is taking the Zodek to the zoo. 
Yeah, emulating the zoo experience. <laughs> emulating the zoo experience. <laughs> All right, a defender of Argus <laughs> can get some work done right now. Uh, is able to make an effective trade with this 2 1, or just continue pushing the damage to face if he wants to go that way. Because well, uh, if again, he really, really wants to emulate the zoo experience, you should take the value trades, right? Definitely. Right, yeah, exactly. Skill their minions. <laughs> This is the best phrase ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, guys. All right, you can have it. It's fine. Thank you. Well, he didn't emulate this experience here. He just went for face. <laughs> so what do we do now, boys? Okay. I mean, Abusive Sergeant is punishing for that decision to go face for sure. Has the Void Walker to play down as well. And with that Leroy in hand, Kamlan will now, after seizing this board, which he'll be able to do based on the hands, pretty effectively in Eternal 2, unless something changes in Ness's hand. Once he's established that board dominance, he's going to start making that aggressive push to face. Yeah, that was yeah. a pretty fast story, son. Kelman just needs like a Soul Fire to pair with this Azur Drake. Or a Power Overwhelming even. That's yep. Well, now that Emperor, that huge tempo swing, being able to just remove your opponent. Your opponent spent their entire turn playing one minion, and you can remove it for one mana. Right. Not to mention that that imp that he's using is kind of like a free token from a removal spell that he used before. Yeah. So, like the overall tempo splash that ended up coming off those two cards of Implosion and Power Overwhelming is just so ridiculous. And it's basically reversed the state of the board completely the combining those two cards together. So now Kamen will have board, board presence, board advantage, card advantage. Yeah, he has an advantage in every way except health currently, but health isn't too relevant at this point. The mid-range warlock, well, they're both mid-range warlock. I don't. I was about to say the mid-range <laughs> warlock appears to be uh, outpacing the other mid-range warlock. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is actually an interesting like breaking point for Kamlan here. With that Leroy Soulfire in hand now, he can just decide to push face, but he can also limit the options by you know, trading with the, the Defender of Argus on the board, try and protect his Drake a little bit from some flexible removal options. But I like pushing face at this point. He knows he hasn't got the till the end of time here. He's the one playing the bursty win condition. So the, the onus is on him to like spread the initiative, make it happen. Absolutely, I agree with that as well. Just looking at your hand with Lyra and so far, you, you can make that decision. If the hand will be a bit different, like slower, then we probably trade in the Dominion to avoid any, any kind of buffs, but uh, this was nice. Yeah, I mean, like, the Argus has already been played, so, like, what really buff spells are you afraid of? Mm. There's not many, and it, like... Right. We've seen Double double Peddler as well from... You've seen Ar Double Peddler, you've seen Dark Bomb, you've seen Argus, so yeah. there's not too many things that can really punish you, so I think the risk is fine. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Ness is just considering his options here. I'm not sure what, if any, big game Hunter targets are in this deck. I don't think it goes that far up the curve, right? It goes, it just... uh, the top end is Leroy, yeah. two Ezra Drakes, and one Belcher. Right. I think it doesn't even matter that much because big game Hunter is a good. It's just a good menu on this board. Mm -hmm. it, it contests the 4-4, four, four, that, uh, that one free is uh, just not contesting it at all, so... I like it. And uh, follow with. Uh, do you play Void Caller or Hillbot here? Yeah, it's interesting because you're really close to getting the full value out of the Hillbot. It's not like you sacrifice too much. Whereas with one card in hand, this is a really easy bluff to call for your opponent. So um, you might expect just this 3 4 to go down to the Drake pretty easily here, which then reduces the overall value of your big game hunter as well because that's the trade that you're trying to set up. So it's a, it's a really interesting decision overall. Yeah. So now what gives you the best value here? It's just overpower, you get a Warlock. Knife Juggler, Imp Gang Boss. Your opponent's only got one card. You're pretty close to lethal. I feel like it's a good time to get some minions out on the field. Even just like using Owl here might not even be terrible. So I think you do a Knife Juggler, Imp Gang Boss. I'm just not sure if you go you Owl attack or first? if you go tap. Yeah, you attack into the 3-4 the first, right? Unless you're Owling. Yeah, it looks like he is going to go for the owl just to be 100% safe. This does reduce his outs to maybe Sludge Belcher, things like that, if they come out of the deck. But, I mean, he does get that extra 2-1 on board. Starts to represent a ton of damage here as well if he starts pushing a bunch of more damage face. Of course, that Leroy Soulfire still in hand to be able to push through the last points he needs if he gets close. Do you guys remember the times when Soulfire was 4-0? I do. Yeah. It was glorious. <laughs> you played it in Handlock, and turn four, you played a Mountain Giant and Soul fired their board. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Here, a good Shadow Flame would just um, swing the game, but uh, no Shadow Flame there. So, Iron Bigal, possibly for a 1 3, maybe. Yeah, that was that's like huge right there. If there was any AoE like at all, like the game could be going totally differently. <laughs> 
Yep, Does, no such luck. So Healbot can take him up to 27 right now. That's the best defensive play he can make. He can then owl the 1-3 to be able to take better trades into higher value minions here. So he is able to reduce enough damage overall to survive on the board here, but he is seriously playing from behind right now. He's he's in danger of just slipping down the delaying the inevitable route right now and just like, but honestly, what, what proactive play can he possibly make to try and like, swing the state of this game in anywhere in his favor right now. Yeah, it's just so hard for him to keep up with the, the zoo experience from Kalman. Is just getting in so much chip damage. Chooses to not even that play the heal bot here, not respecting the damage, and that is just going to be enough damage with the, uh, the Soulfire following this up. Leroy Jenkins pushes through, and the spell power on the Soulfire is going to be exact lethal. One game to one, Kalman ties it up. Yeah, an impressive win then there in the, the Warlock World of Mirror match. This means that Warlock for Nas is eliminated. Now they are 1 1 overall. Um, what do you take as Nas to fight this mid range zoo? I mean, Agu now now from Ness's perspective, the series really begins because, as I said, I was talking strategy with him before, and he was just saying, okay, I mean, I just need to find something to beat the Druid, and then it's Priest carry time. So the Druid is gone, so from this point, he just feels like he queues up Priest, thinks he has a favorable matchup against the Burst Warlock, and then he's up against Patron, which is classically a very highly favored matchup as well, especially because he's carrying Harrison in his Priest as well. So. Yeah, it may not be as easy as he thinks, though. If Priest doesn't get the Zombie Chow or something like this, and uh, Kalman's able to get down Piloted Shredders or Ezra Drakes, Priest traditionally can struggle a lot against four attack, attack minions. minions. Yeah, and uh, again, I was talking to Ness before, and I, you know, I said, you know, he can, he can get a good start and you can whiff. He's like, no, 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 he's just going to play like Lepanome or Dark Peddler, and I just respond with Chow, and I was like, Okay, what happens if you don't draw Chow? Is that like, wait, people don't draw Chow with yeah. Priest? <laughs> <laughs> so this is why he brought Priest to yes, the tournament. Yes, exactly. This is why he is in top four <laughs> at the very moment. Yeah. Well, we've seen him getting Taurus on every, every turn. I mean, every that's a good Priest match. hand. Yep. I mean, this guy knows how to Priest. I think that's pretty clear. Zombie Chow into Death Lord is uh, one of the dreams. Has the Pyromancer for utility as well, so he can sweep some boards with Power Shield. If, that creeps out of his deck and yeah, I mean, this is just the situation, right? Like play your minions, I have a zombie chow. Coins out a two drop to trade with a one drop. This is the situation. This yeah. is what the zoo experience is like right now, Fiber. <laughs> it's not a good one. The theme park needs repairs, it's terrible. <laughs> well, even the fact that Ness actually went first was uh, pretty good for him. Yeah, yeah, going first as Priest is pretty good. I mean, sure. I guess you take Voidwalker. Yeah, I mean, just a pile of average dudes really from the Dark Peddler. I feel like we've seen a disproportionate amount of uh, Dark Peddlers that haven't really been offering the power cards this whole weekend. We've we've seen a lot of like Shield Bearer tournament attendee angry chicken picks, and it's just like, oh, thanks, buddy. Well, to be honest, like Ness got a soul fire from uh, one of right. the peddlers and was able to kill Life Coach with that specific soul fire. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh, this is a pretty good turn, actually. Being able to get the power overwhelming and the abusive down to be able to trade up, and then the one drops to fill out the curve there. Yeah, and I mean, kind of disrespecting the 2-2 a little bit. I understand how highly he values having that Pyromancer alive on the board right now, but, you know, clearing any kind of zoo-ish decks board is always so much more powerful than leaving even the smallest minion behind, but would have taken a pretty insane level of uh, foresight and discipline to trade a Pyromancer into a 2-2 there. To yeah, the it board. doesn't feel good, but it definitely would have been correct. He's getting a little bit punished here for right. it, allowing yeah. this power overwhelming to activate. And this deck has a lot of good minions as well, like you can get a Nazar Drake or a Lesser Drake, double shredder. What are you doing? Face! Now, do you soul fire to protect the Leroy? I yes. think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have like sense. terrible cards in your hand, so it's Yeah, okay. exactly. Next turn is turn four. So right. there is actually Shadow War Death for the Leroy, but <laughs> it was possible the Leroy would connect to face twice. This has actually worked out in like insanely well. Like Kamlan would have gone, okay, awesome. Like I got Leroy off, off Death Lord, but you know, potentially that can weaken the, the power of second power overwhelming, whatever else he has in his deck. But yeah, that's the only charger in this deck. Right. So if Kamlin ever loses the board. Things like Power Overwhelming, things like Abusive Sergeant aren't going to be able to be used for face damage anymore. Right, and also, Ness just had nothing to do that turn. So yeah. The fact that he just got to cast Shadow of Death on the only Shadow of Death target in the deck, right? Because yeah, yeah, the only that, one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it, it seems good to just get a free charging 6-2 to face, but I think, all things considered, that exchange comes out really heavily in favor of Ness. Yeah, definitely. There is one charge possible, by the way, Firebat, and you might be familiar with it. As a Stone Tusk <laughs> Boar? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's still one Peddler in the deck. Still one peddler can get the stone tusk board to activate the second power overwhelming 
Is he going to use the flash heal here? Or is he going to value it as a health gain? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm fine with this. He's still a decent competitive minion on the board. He's asking big questions to be answered from the opponent, but there is the dart bomb that can be used to trade out really nicely here. Do you have to do it, though? I, Okanai is really devastating if hero power becomes deal to damage and uh, you start losing the board, so maybe dart bomb is actually the play here. Why did Ness even play the Alcanai? He could have just, like, healed himself and tried to build up the light bomb a little bit. Yeah. Now yeah. this allows Kalman to like trade off his things that died a light bomb the turn before light bomb. Develop a board that's more resilient if he wants. And it's not like Ness has uh, any draw in hand. No, we're, we're going to trade off the thing that doesn't die to light bomb <laughs> instead. Well, <laughs> he's keeping the most power on the board. He figures he needs to be aggressive, I guess. Yeah. So he's taking a risk here, so that's fine. Light bomb turn. <laughs> I mean, this doesn't feel like a very good light bomb, but I guess you got to do it. I mean, what else are you doing, right? Yeah, you got two of them. Exactly. <laughs> yep, light bomb, a couple of one drops, oh, take two damage for your troubles, just priest things. And Ooh. now, okay, now we're in business. Pilot yeah. Shredder is a minion that you want to hit with this deck for sure against priests. So Pilot yeah. Shredder develops into play, and now suddenly things are getting a bit more threatening from Ness's perspective. Yeah, I think like Ness just threw away this uh, Okanai, but uh, True Heart is a really good card to be able to heal even more. Yeah, that's going to help him definitely stay out of range of this burst. Also, just buffing it uh, outside of the range of the 4 3. 11 damage. So there's no top deck that does it because Leroy's out. Nope, but Implosion Dart Bomb will always take care of that just a car. He's seen a Light Bomb, but he's also seen that a couple of cards are being held over time in Ness's hands. So he'll put them on being situational removal cards. You know, maybe a Holy Nova, maybe an Entomb, that kind of thing. But honestly, you probably would have Entombed the Piloted Shredder if you're familiar with the deck list in terms of the threat density. Yeah, yeah. But uh Can you can you ignore the true heart? Yeah, I don't see you could. Life top. No, the problem is it like allows him to pop your shredder which sets up his light bombs. You just can't let your board get full cleared out. Void ever. Walker? Like you ignore the, the true heart if you ignore the true heart you definitely uh, play the I think he's afraid of playing the Void Walker because of Cabal. That's why he held it back the previous turns. Sure. Yeah, so it looks like it is gonna be the implosion dot bomb turn. Does roll the four here, so it's a pretty huge looking board. Yeah. And he's going to decide whether he wants to develop this Void Walker That's alongside it. As you said, Threat of Cabal. I think you do it now, though, because, yeah. like, if your opponent Cabal's it, you're not too sad. They're, they're spending all of their mana doing that, and you're probably going to get lethal. Yeah, but uh, we are going to see the Light Bomb, I believe. Or, or do we see the Light Bomb? Do you just Entomb the Shredder here? Uh, so if you Entomb the Shredder, you're at 16 health, and there is 5 power on board, so not the end of the world, definitely a decent consideration. There's now 3 power on board, so you've only reduced the, the net, like, the net gain is like 2 health from that situation using Light Bomb over Entomb, and you feel like Light Bomb will be a better card as the game develops than Entomb will, so it's, a, it's an interesting decision there for sure. Yeah, now Ness may struggle against like maybe second piloted Shredder or if uh, Kalman is able to find a Zerdrakes or any of his mid-rangey creatures because he's out of light bombs so Kalman can just freely overextend. He saw the Alcani get tossed out earlier so... And there is the circle of healing off the top as well so if that Alcani hadn't been played and uh, Ness was just a little bit more chill sitting back doing crease things, healing face, letting the board build up then uh, he could have had an additional board clear available to him this turn does have the, the, the Death Lord for defense, but we do see the Owl in hand as well. So if he Death Lords, heals his face up to 16. There is eight power on board, plus the power overwhelming is 12 and Owling the Death Lord out of the way. So it's getting pretty close here if he doesn't choose to use that Flash Heal as well. Uh, so yeah. you're going to Entomb Juggler? The weakness of this Warlock deck really is the fact that there's like no Death Rattles. The only thing that's really kind of a Death Rattle is like uh, Imp Gang Boss. It's not really a Death Rattle, right, but yeah. it kind of acts as a Death Rattle. It and emulates the Death Rattle experience. Yeah, yes. It emulates the Death <laughs> Rattle experience. But other than that, I mean, board clears are so strong against this deck. So things like Alcani Circle, things like Light Bomb, uh, hold, like, a lot of value. Definitely. But then, like, Ness is out of cards, almost. Yeah. Only I mean, he, he drew, like, in such a situation where he had the removals, but he didn't have anything else. So then he had to kind of use them a little earlier than he maybe would have liked to, just because he had nothing else to do. Right. And maybe there's a little bit of impatience there, or maybe if he didn't use them, he felt afraid he was just going to die to the burst. So it got him into a really sticky spot just the way he drew. I think definitely he is affected by the fact that he is on the stage again. Uh, in the top four, it's uh, 
for him, it's uncharted waters. Like, last time he got eliminated in top eight, this is the first time he is in the top four. Uh, well, he was in the final before, but uh, not like such Right, I mean, way. Insomnia before the first True Silver champion was a very different animal. The, yeah. the Hearthstone tournament was pretty much UK only. There wasn't a big stage, big production, all of this stuff. So um, his, his experience with being on stage is pretty much only limited to the first True Silver championship before this one. Interesting, he chooses not to owl there. He could have set Ness down to one HP there that turn. He chose to owl the, uh, the Death Lord. Velen's chosen circle of healing flash heal. This is a priest hand right here. Yeah, that's not doing much. Yeah, and just obligated to use this flash heal here. He can't really wait too much longer. Only one Orcanai left in the deck, and if he draws that Orcanai, he knows he has an effective board sweep with the circle of healing anyway. Giant Drake comes out to play here, and that will go ahead and ruin the spectator mode experience <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, yeah, in a bit. Obviously, like, Drake is on the board right now, and there is a card being drawn, which we will see in just a moment. And but we see attacks getting queued up. So you hit him in the face with everything and then pass the turn. So we can assume Ness is still alive currently. And uh, Kamlan hopes that there is no Holy Nova, I believe. <laughs> oh, man. Finish chosen. Uh, so that is game. If I'm doing my maths correctly while not being able to see what's yeah. going on. He's at 15 now. There's an Ezra Drake. So there's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 on the board. 11 on the board. Uh, yeah. 11 to 15. Right. Yeah. Did yeah. he get a power overwhelming or soul fire? We don't know. That's he such a crashing board. loss because this priest was supposed to win versus Zoo and he got the zombie chow. I well. actually think the, the hybrid warlock's favored. <laughs> I've, been, I've been playing a lot of the hybrid warlock on ladder recently after I saw Kalman playing it because I was intrigued. And uh, I've had a positive win rate against Priest as well. I nice. think okay. it's just like they can't handle the piloted shredders too efficiently. They can't deal with your board while dealing with piloted shredder because they want to entomb it or something. So then your board gets chip damage in. And you usually get around 20 damage worth of burst in your hand. <laughs> and that usually kills Priest. Yeah, it makes sense. Like even if they have a true heart, you can still plow for that. Yeah, yeah. It's just the fact that they can't kill your board enough. They like... If they get Alcanized Circle, that's the way that they really get you. But if they don't get an Alcanized Circle off, you usually win. Yep. All right, makes sense. And still no lethal picked up from, from Kamelin here. He's going to have to take his time. There is the Alcanized Circle. Wow. Series. And we know he doesn't have any burst in hand. Right. So Alcanized Circle will clear this board apart from a couple of 1-1s. He's healed himself back up to 6 HP, so 4 damage out of range right now. And the Velens chose... Uh, wait. Wait, what? You're supposed to Velen's afterwards, right? Like, what's the reason to Velen's before? To damage your... Yes, yeah, small misplay there. Yeah, yeah, take yeah. a little extra damage on accident. He could have had a 5-5 five five instead right. of a 5-4. Exactly. But he's got a chance to win this game now. Kalman's deck doesn't have very much... Uh, like, he's used both implosions, right? Uh, he's Seven yeah. I mean, plus... Leroy is gone. He's used both dark... He needs, like... like yeah, he can't tap, right? Like he's if both he... dark bombs. So he's got 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 damage looking at him. If he taps, he's dead. Yeah, unless he finds lethal. Unless he finds lethal. And his only lethal is what? Is there even a lethal? I think we've seen both Dark Bombs gone. We've seen, have we seen a Soul Fire used? Is there he, may be a double Soul is Fire. Is he playing lethal. Doomguards? He's not playing Doomguards. There's, There's no, doomguards. no Doomguards. There's no more charge minions. No more charge. Not, both not Peddlers even, are gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no Stone Tusk Stone Boar. Tusk Boar is out of the question, Nim. Are you guys telling me he's actually turning this game around on the back of this? Uh, yeah, I told you. Alcani Circle, circle if, they, if that happens, you die. Yeah, like literally, yeah. as you said it, like the way you lose is Orcanite. Oh, there's an Orcanite. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. the owl, there we go. He's still okay. alive. He's still alive for now. Ah, right. Oh, wow. He's uh, turning into a defensive warlock now. Flame Imp is bold, but I guess he needs something out there. Well, this is the second Okanai, so Flash Heal, flash heal would be It's so silenced, though. So. That would have been so brutal. That would yeah. be so lethal. I mean, the Flash Heal being used to stabilize here is perfectly fine as well. Like He'll be happy with it. Sure. Well, this game is not over, guys, so... Um, Just getting started. With but Kalman has everything. almost no cards left in his deck. If you look at the, the size of his deck there, that's got to be like two or three cards left. Oh, there is an Implosion remaining as well. So Implosion and Soulfire in hand. So he was super close to lethal last turn, having that Soulfire in hand, just couldn't find that last little piece of damage. And Ness is going to continue to prioritize the healing his card. face. And that is the last card. <laughs> He's yeah. got to make it happen. Do you play 4-3 first? Like if you hit 4, you will not be able to... Oh, actually, you can still like trade, so it's fine. Yeah, trades in the owl. So he trades the owl, and he's now representing 4, 7, 11 damage on the board, plus the soul fire is 15. So Ness Holy needs Nova? a defensive card this turn. Oh, gets the, the ball! Wow. The ball is huge here. Yeah. 
He still needs to figure out a way to clear this board, though. Otherwise, the, the Shredder and whatnot is going to continue hitting face. He needs, like, Holy Nova or something. Right. He needs a clear or he needs continuous survival cards because he only has to stall out a little bit because... Yeah. The, you know, a point the Cabal has to be respected from his opponent before because the Cabal just represents lethal plus mm -hmm. the fatigue damage at some point. Yeah, but like Shredder is actually cancelled by the hero power. Right. Yeah. So it's it seems it's like Ness really is in close. okay shape. Yeah. It's really, really close. The draws for Ness coming up will be crucial, and there are quite a few whiffs in his deck. There's, there's things like North Cleric, which of course can function as a redraw in some situations, yeah. but there are still some situational priest cards left. But Holy Nova will be an immediate blowout if it's so. On from Kamlin's perspective, to maximize damage, do you attack with the free two into the one two, and yeah, and then like yeah, uh, yeah. so far yes. attack with one one. You want to preserve as many imps as possible, yeah. <laughs> oh man, this this game is down to the wire. <laughs> There is a rope coming for Kamlin. Not that many choices. Is he thinking about going face? I mean, there's a bunch of ways you can ration out damage here. You can keep the soul fire. You can trade the soul fire into the Cabal and go full board. You can even maximize your board power by trading the Shredder and one of the 1-1s, one which exposes you to the maximum to AoE. Second um, as well. That gives, Kalman has lethal with the soul fire with 14 damage, right? He's got 4, 8, 9, 6, six 10. 4, 5, it's 6, 7, 13. 13. 13. It's a 2 offer. attack minion, right? Like if, 13. Okay. Yeah, but so yeah. this gets stolen, he heals face. There's only. It's only 12. It's only, yeah. It like, should be over. No, it's right? only 10, right? Oh, yeah, it's maybe, only right? 10 now. It's only 10, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're so good at counting. Seems like Ness, Ness, Ness also threatens lethal next turn. Yeah. Yeah, he looks like he's it's able over. to stabilize. This is over. Wow, Ness! The double Cabal back to back top deck to stabilize. I mean, there's, there's even like shredder magic can't happen here. There's no shredder drop that there's a shredder drop that can keep him alive, sure, but there's nothing that with no cards left in deck can put him in a position where he's able to win the game. So, wow. Yep, this was an incredible game. Like we thought it's over. After yeah, I that thought for game. sure. But then the Alcani came out of nowhere for the Alcani circle. Kalman just had he had like six turns where he needed like any amount of burn to win the game. That Leroy from the Death Lord, right? Yeah, All the way yeah. back on turn three or whatever it was. Like that Leroy coming out, like it looked awesome at first. We were like, well, Leroy, but like all things considered, when you lose that platform for all your buff damage to be used as burst at the end of the game and you gave Ness a turn when his hand was absolutely terrible light bomb light bomb shadower death I think at the time mm -hmm. just turns out to be such a massive swing for Ness and it's able to go out to a 2-1 lead here with the priest deck and now has priest Harrison priest versus patron incredible incredible so far about take me through that matchup priest versus patron <laughs> priest versus patron all right, well, the patron tries very, very hard, and the priest light bombs him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's even worse than versus rogue or versus control warrior? Is it like the same level of difficulty? It's worse, probably worse than versus control warrior. Like priest, nah, it depends. Is Kalman running piloted shredders or is he running? He is running shredders. Leads? Okay, then sometimes you can stabilize the Shredders. Shredders can do a lot of work. Just the same thing as what happened in this matchup. Like sometimes Priest can't deal with Shredder. That's one of the big problems with Priest. So if he's able to get that down, it can be really brutal. But if Priest is able to get Alcani Circle or if they're able to just get a Light Bomb, they are usually in a pretty okay spot. Yep, so we are really close to having a UK representative in the final. Well, I can tell you one of these cards that's being kept. The two of them, he's gonna keep Harrison Jones and Light Bomb for sure. I would think. And Pyromaster, is Pyromaster should be okay, right? In the very beginning to find back, or do you throw it away? It's not an overly useful card in the matchup, so honestly playing it out as a dude on turn two and seeing if it gets war axed is often the best use for it, so I wouldn't hate keeping that as well. So yeah, what else are you looking for? Trade with like an Accolade of Pain or something? Right, it's yeah, not exactly, terrible. Yeah. So well, we've got some weapons. Weapons yeah. are good against Priest, I've heard. So this must be a fantastic hand then, right, Fiber? I mean, it is pretty good, honestly. Like, you want to be using all of your Despites and all of your War Axes to go face for the most part. So having them early, being able to just set up a situation where on turn 8, if you top deck Grom, you win, sure. is usually how Patron wins. They just face Warrior the Priest. <laughs> yeah, that, that might be the only way. Like, if he gets a Frolling Berserker somewhere along the way as well, and he's yeah. able to connect to face with maybe 4 to 5 damage. Sure. Yeah, it's just all about trying to maximize getting in uh, face damage. Set up situations where you make patrons where something survives when they light bomb so that you can get chip damage in or what have you. Just figure out ways to be able to use your resources to inflict damage. How Ness much? was, sorry, mousing over Norsha Cleric there for turn one. I don't think, with the Death Lord in hand, I don't think there's any reason to play a turn one Cleric here, right? No, no, it's always wrong because 
if he gets War Axed, you're super disappointed, and this is a matchup where you want to definitely be using the early game to draw cards. Right, and if you have a hand that, you know, is never going to protect Norsha Cleric, I can see it being more reasonable just to get down on the board, but when you can hide it behind a Death Lord in a couple of turns, I just don't see the merit in putting it out on the board there. So an unnecessary yeah. risk there, and he's get getting punished. Yeah, I mean, he could have eventually gotten, like, the Death Lord down and then played Northshire Cleric with a Wild Pyromancer and right. used that to damage his own minions and play Circle and draw his entire deck. Uh, how important is Death Lord in this matchup? Is there like any specific card that can lose you the game uh, when uh, pulled from Death Lord? I mean, sometimes they get Grom and you can't answer it, <laughs> and that's a real bummer. Right. Sometimes you can pull out a Patron, neutralize it immediately, get one of their big threats dealt with. It, it can happen, but generally it's just mostly used in this kind of situation as it is in most matchups. Nothing particularly spectacular. Just put an annoying dude in the way for them to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to deal with if there's no execute, actually. It's uh, going to suck out a lot of damage. So start with attacking with your Acolyte into Death Lord, see what you draw, and uh, if there's nothing else, you just play Shroud. Yeah, yeah may like even it. decide to inner rage it here. He can do seven total damage to it if he wanted to go super ham with the Death Spy, but that seems ambitious. But he might try to try and uh, max out Fiery War Axe into it this turn, has the Death Spy follow up on the previous turn to deal with it that way. Sure. Not even attacking? Like, what would be the reason there? Yeah, holding back the attack, I guess. Uh I'm not sure. It, it is kind of weak against Valen's Chosen, so that's the downside of holding back the attack, because then you can get only one draw off your Acolyte, but sure. He wants the ability to interrage it, I guess, the surprise factor. If maybe uh, Ness heals it up, then he trades in the piloted Shredder, Despite swings, then can interrage the Acolyte to trade into another minion. Yeah, makes sense. So just plays down the Pyromancer here behind the Death Lord, gives him a decent amount of utility later on, but I think the interaction we're going to see very quickly here is uh, Death Spite followed up by Harrison Jones. And I guess the, the, <laughs> the thing that we didn't gloss, uh, gloss over a little bit at the start of the game is having both Death Spite is pretty crucial when the first one gets Harrison because you then have the security. Knowing that Harrison is in the deck and then knowing that it's been used, you don't have that fear anymore of holding on to the second Death Spite charge. You know you're yeah. free to wait for the optimal moment to use it. Well, first, you might try drawing two cards, right, before you even go for Death Spite. Sure. Let's I mean, like, Harrison Jones is really good at killing Despite, but Despite is also really good at killing Harrison Jones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep, that is fair. And Despite's going to come down. He's just not even going to use his, his card draw option here. He's just going to straight up attack into the Death Lord. And Dread Corsair comes down. I mean, that card costs zero mana right now anyway, yeah. so, like, that's, that's nothing. It is a draw, though, so that's not bad. Thins yep. your deck out and maybe find Grom faster. So now, after choosing not to draw the card with his Acolyte, what, the, what does he want to do with it? He is going to interrage it just to maximize the tempo on the board. And I really like this, because one of the ways you can win this matchup as the Patron Warrior, if it's not just with a late-game Grom Burst, it's build a board to force them to AoE things that aren't Patrons. I think yep. that was also necessary, because um, it was there is a coin, so it was possibly that uh, Acolyte of Pain will get stolen by Cabo Shadow Priest. Right. And you do have Death Spite equipped, so... Are we going to see Harrison right now, dealing with this Shredder? Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, you got to really deal with Patron's weapons, and it takes care of the first half of this piloted Shredder, so he gets so much value. Is there any reason to maybe keep the Death Spite and bait out the big Patron turn? I mean... He's got a Light Bomb. Exactly. You do yeah. have the Light Bomb, so you can wait and see if the Patrons do come out, Light Bomb that, and then the Harrison on the second Death Spite is almost better than Harrisoning the first Death Spite because for the reasons that I just discussed on the previous turn, so... There is a merit to it, sure, but I mean, it, it's a pretty fantastic Harrison right now, right? The fact you destroy a Death Spite and the first half of a Pilot of Treader. Mm -hmm. And what are your other options, really? Right. So. Coin and Tomb. Yes. <laughs> to <laughs> give it a, a even better Patron turn. No, no, no. I think you, you have Light Bomb that you want to save to deal with Patrons, then you have Entomb you want to save to deal with either Boom or Drum. Yeah. So you, you have all your answers in your hand, you just got to make sure they line up with the right things. And that is a nicely shaped minion from Ness's perspective, because uh, he's sitting with that light bomb in his hand. He's maybe expecting the patrons might come out sometime soon. So seeing a uh, an evenly spaced attack and health minion is, is pretty good from his perspective. But no patrons in the hand just yet for Camlan, so he's going to have to work out how to start redeveloping this board right now. So are you, are you going for frauding Berserker this turn? Um, second Death Spite is not doing that much. You don't have the patience yet, so if you lose double death by like you know Harrison is out of the way, and there's probably no more weapon removal, but uh, you might be tempted to swing in the future. I don't know, Nimch. Fibat told me that Death Spite was pretty good at killing Harrison, and I believe him. So. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of options here. Like the the playing the Death Spite is pretty good because it allows you to set up a Death Spite for next turn, which can help you 
be able to more easily play Dr. Doom, but um, at the same time, it's your second Death Spite charge, so yeah. like, you don't really want to be using it to clear the board to make way for Boom. So maybe you just make the threat of Frothing this turn, which then your opponent reacts to Throthing, develops nothing, and then it allows you to make way for Boom that way. Is there a way to maybe get Frothing to a 3-4? Yeah, you could have went like uh, frothing and then like inner raged the two two and okay. kind of traded that up to just make sure you play around cabal completely. But Coleman realizes he's got a cabal target and then he's just gonna throw another cabal target out there since he already has one. It's actually insane how many turn six threats there are for priests like entomb for your big minion, light bomb for your whole board, or cabal for like two attack minions. Yeah, they got. They and got then an you, you're scared of all of those, so you do nothing and they just play just a card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. Oh man, we see this the steal right there. Good for five on board. Yeah. Well, he can clear the entire board and develop Doctor Boom if he would like to. That is one of his options. Seems decent, actually. He's going to get eaten by Light Bomb, but uh, this is probably his best option here. He also has the ability to like make a big frothing while using Slam to cycle, hold on to the Despite, try and find the patrons. Like Doctor Boom may bait out a Light Bomb, which is really good, but. Right. You don't have the patrons yet. <laughs> yeah, and also from Ness's perspective, he now got the organized circle as well, so he'll be more secure in throwing away that light bomb. Yeah, it is an uphill battle from here. Yeah, Ness can just uh, lean back, relax, and be like, yep, I've got this. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be feeling really comfortable right now. I'm sure he's sitting there inventing possible turns that can come out over the next couple of uh, next few minutes from, from Kamlan here, and I think just with this hand, he pretty much has everything covered that could possibly come out. Yes. It would have to be some sort of insane generation of, of a board plus Lotheb in the same turn on like a nine mana turn maybe or something ridiculous. Like Acolyte of Pain's really good here. If it's able to find maybe Battle Rage or something could be really exceptional. Did you just swing face? Did somebody queued up? I think he did not swing at all. The okay. minion okay. went face all and right. held the weapon, yeah. I was like, that's a questionable death bite swing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said in the very beginning it's good to swing face. Yeah, I mean, in ideal circumstances, that's what you want to be able to be doing. Yeah, definitely. If you have good follow-up of minions and you're actually yeah. pressuring. Right now, it's a weird game for Kamlan because he needs to tend to the board, he needs to find the patrons. Like, he needs to do so many things to be able to win. I like him holding this death bite, though. The whirlwind is going to be extremely important. He could have used it there to try and just kill this 4-5 and draw a card, but it's going to be more impactful later most of the time. Uh, so what are we doing with this turn? Do we think we start with just drawing a card with the Nausea Cleric? It doesn't seem like there's anything that you want to spend all your mana on this turn particularly, so... Probably not throwing your Orcanai Soul Priest again. Right, I mean, there's a decent turn with the Orcanai for sure. Orcanai shooting down the Torn, trade into the Acolyte of Pain, like, seems great. But you, you might feel like you need the two yeah. AoE options still in your hand. Nope, Ness disagrees. He's happy I to jam it here. I really don't like this. I don't know. I think... That's one of the ways that you can uh, run into trouble. Like, if you just be patient, you can fatigue the patron. Just, right. like, save your answers for the right situations. But, uh... Oh, how much damage is this? Like, you need six, 16 damage right now. Uh, 18 damage, right? He has the Inner Rage as well to buff up Grom even further. Well, and now that the sure. uh, Alcani is going to be gone, he can make patrons this turn while clearing the entire board, which is going to force out a Light Bomb. And then he can play Boom, which will get entombed, and then he can play Grom, <laughs> which will get death. Yes. So Ness still has... All right, nice. Ness, Ness is through to the finals, I guess. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just like now realizing that Ness's play is fine because like, he what everything. does he have to worry about? He doesn't need another Right, he's player. rationed yeah. out his removal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got enough. feels like he has stuff covered. I, I, didn't see, yeah. I didn't see that Shadow of Death at the end there, so right. this makes total sense with the, the Shadow of Death. Asserting dominance is like, hey, I have so many threats in my hand that I'm just slamming organize all priests and be like sure play your patrons i still have a lot of stuff here i mean you have to play the patron here it's yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely. unavoidable for sure fully clears the board it's really clean i don't think you use the inner range i think you hold that back using that for burst damage is going to be really important uh, activate Grom. yeah unfortunately um even the uh frothing you can't this is a play I, I thought you could make once where you make a big patron board and then you play a frothing berserker afterwards Okay. Light bomb quote insurance. You could have done that here, but it would only be two patrons. Yeah, it also doesn't work. It doesn't work because uh, Frodin gets buffed when light bomb starts sticking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it import it's important to know. I tried it once and then got right. punished really hard and I've never been there again. As well, yeah. yeah. I was really surprised. It seems like it should work though, right? Like, it does seem like it should. Yeah. There's a lot of weird mechanics in Hearthstone like that. Like the before 
Mildred didn't work because uh, the explosive sheep right. poison seeds didn't actually clear the board, but now it does. Yep. So they like just silently changed that without telling anybody. And then every <laughs> streamer in the world noticed and went, sweet, Mildred time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So maybe that's not supposed to work that way, and will someday like it'll randomly change. So I guess. Oh, I hope so. That like maybe so. it changed before this game. Like maybe mid tournament. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe he should have just tried it. Yeah. Farbot is the final of this tournament. He goes with the exploded sheep poison seeds. Wait. <laughs> 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 All right. So Death Lord in play, and as Firebat pointed out before, still plenty of options in tomb. In tomb for the boom, death for the grom. Uh, has a nice ring to it, as well as being extremely satisfying for the Priest player. So it is hard to imagine a world where this goes wrong. But if the way that Kamlan, I can potentially see him coming back into this is just with the other minions in the deck that aren't the huge threats. Because apart from those earmarked removal cards that Ness has in hand, he doesn't have any gas of his own right now. He's sat around with one of those awkward Priest hands that's just waiting to react to the right situation. The only, yeah. the only way I, I see I like myself it. is like a maybe second patron somewhere along the way with Ness not having the cards and throwing away a second North Shire Cleric. Well, if he can put pressure on Ness like this with these mid-range minions and Ness feels like he's in such pressure that he has to entomb or something, but no, if that Velen's chosen on that Death Lord, he is going to very easily be able to deal with these threats. Drawing some cards, having a big minion on board. Power Word Shield as well. Well, have not seen an execute yet, so I'd like to see this on the Norsha Cleric. Yep, good decision there from Ness. Lotheb is not really going to get the job done. Execute, both executes, both battle rages still stuck in the deck for Camlan, assuming he's playing two of both, which is a pretty safe bet for a patron deck. So, uh, pretty unfortunate scenario here. Just three big old bombs in his hand and a priest full of a priest hand full of answers to bombs. So, so, so are we going to start talking about unbelievable now? Like. Uh, does he need a patient assassin from the Shredder to be ba to be able to come back? I don't know. I think you can just Grom it. Like, Grom gets enough value here, even if he gets entombed or death. Like, you push forward with the Shredder. You lose your big burst, which kind of sucks, but maybe you can get down a board with Lothab, and that's your new win condition. Okay. Like, if he finds Patron next turn, maybe he can go Patron Lothab and uh, trade in the Ghoul or something. Yeah. Develop a lot of power really quick. Well, Kamlan is definitely fighting. He doesn't know exactly what Ness has in his hand. He knows this is a bad matchup. And he's going to be doing good decisions there. I mean, Priest is a deck where it can completely win a game and then just draw just a bunch of heals that do nothing and then die. Like, Priest <laughs> is a deck that that can happen to. Like, it feels so favored in a lot of matchups and then can sometimes just fumble in the last few turns. So what's the place of Priest in the metagame at the very moment? Ness was the only one who brought it to the top 16, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he was the only priest in top 16 for sure, yeah. Um, well. it's, it's it's just always in this position where you feel like you can build it to beat aggro or you can build it to beat control, but there's none. Of, there's no, like, the, the control warrior build that everyone's playing right now, for example, has found this great balance where it can do both using Elise. Um, and I know some priest decks have experimented with that same thing to not quite as spectacular effect. So it's always in this awkward spot where there's just a strange balance between what you're targeting with it in the meta. Yeah, okay. it's like you just can't beat the mid-range decks, and it turns out right. most people like playing mid-range decks. Yeah, playing dudes on curve turns out to be quite powerful in Hearthstone. Who knew? Yeah. Speaking about Elise, it's actually there for Ness as well in the deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so Zombie Chow comes down, a slightly irritating board here. The Grim Patron is drawn, but there's nothing to trade the uh, Unstable <laughs> Ghoul into right now. I think you still do it. I think it just mounts like the most amount of pressure, stops Light Bomb from being used, and you just hope for the best. Like, how does the, the priest actually even like kill it? Uh, well, you want a patron Lothab? Yeah, yeah. How yeah, does yeah. he how does he deal with the patron efficiently? Like right, Light Bomb can't be cast, Entomb can't be cast. So, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. He'd have to have exactly Cabal to rip the 1-3 out of the way, and then still, how does he generate the source of 3 damage, yeah, right? So. Yeah. Unless he teched in Abusive Sergeant, it's probably <laughs> yeah. going to replicate. <laughs> yeah. And if he's cabaling the Unstable Ghoul, you don't care, because then you just run the Patron into it and right. make a ton of Patrons. Yeah. Then Light Bomb comes out, then you drop Boom, you got a chance all of a sudden. Interesting. So yeah. You're so. saying there's a chance. I would love to see that. I would love to see that Loth and Patron here. Yeah, I don't see how it gets punished. I think you got to YOLO it. Kamlan is definitely thinking about his options there. Yeah. And the Rob is running away. He's going with Boom instead, okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, he's seen one Light Bomb, he's seen uh, Okanai already, so he hopes maybe there is no AoE. 
Roxbat immediately shaking his head after that boom play, so he obviously doesn't feel in a particularly comfortable position here, and uh, this is this is awkward. He's maybe, I mean, he's deliberately if the if I think cabaling the unstable goal is what I'm trying to say would be a mistake here from Ness because it creates oh, yeah. a world where the patrons can come down. It's a tempting target for sure, but it pushes the initiative back to your opponent to be able to deal with it and play patrons. Um, he does have the choice in hand with the Entomb to deal with the Dr. Boom. He has plenty of stabilization for his life, so he doesn't need to do anything too ambitious right now. Just deal with that 7-7 and move on. I think he could also draw a card like easy here to start with. Yeah, definitely start with drawing a card. But right. like one thing in his mind, he also doesn't have to worry about uh, Grom. So the only yeah. thing he's got to worry about really killing him is Lothip. So he's got to figure out how can I set up my board in such a way that Lothip is the least punishing it can possibly be. And uh, that's kind of tricky. <laughs> All right, so he's going to set off the boom bots here. Gets the one immediate draw from the Acolyte of Pain. Zombie Chow dies. So does the Acolyte, but that's two immediate card draws. And now we have second Orc and I circle. <laughs> and second second light bomb. bomb in the hand. Well, This is uh, going to be a struggle. I don't want to call it right now, but I think we may have UK representation in our grand finals here. I think there is a, a slight chance that will happen, yes. Oh, Battle Rage makes magical things happen. Sure. He can draw cards, but uh, what is he looking for at this very moment? Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. He needs like an Arcanite Reaper and a Leroy Jenkins, and this is an easy game. All right. I mean, we'll see if those are tech choices <laughs> that he decided to bring to this tournament. Um, I mean, even Camel Deathwing would not work. Yeah, Deathwing would not work. Right. It's the the common caster out of what what card does he need here? Old oh, Deathwing. It's usually not the case against Priest. That's quite often one of the worst cards you could draw. Oh, Battle Rage off Battle Rage is something. He is able to replenish his hand. Oh, those cards are not helpful very much. There are no, not that many helpful cards in his deck. None yeah. of those cards are Arcanite, Arcanite Reaper or think, Leroy Jenkins. So. I think you do just execute that so you can make sure you hit the face damage. Like, a, even though the trade is, like, pretty good for you, I just executed just so you could hit four to face. Like, mm. the damage is so important. Yeah, it makes sense. And, like, you don't want that North Shark Cleric to be able to trade into your uh, Lothip with the Alcanized Circle. Yep, Camlan reaches the same conclusion here. Seems totally legitimate. Um, but the Priest is able to just stabilize very slowly here. As long as he doesn't die pretty much on exactly this turn, he's probably going to feel fairly comfortable being able to climb back into this game from any situation presented to him. So what will, what will bring the biggest damage? There is a possible Fire War Axe, like a second one. We've seen double Death Spy, one, yep. one War Axe. Yep. Um, can he draw even more cards? Not really, just one I think draw. The, the biggest possible thing you can possibly expect is Inner Rage, Cruel Taskmaster, Fiery War Axe. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest possible burn you can expect in this situation. Sometimes they run Finley and they could sure. get like the Hunter Hero power right. or yeah, something. That's fair. But like honestly, if there's the Okanai, so it's still all right. But if, the, if there will be Fiery War Axe in hand and maybe another Inner Rage, Still, no chance because there is an Orcanai. So he's thinking about Orcanai Flash Heal just to kill the 5-5 five five here? Is that what's going on? Yeah, that removes his burst healing, which is kind of scary. Right. Especially since he's going to have an Alcanai in play, which then Kalman can just ignore for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. And if he does have a Leroy, he finds that War Axe. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's happening. It could happen. Wow. The Priest is not killing him anytime soon. If there's a Leroy in Kalman's deck and he finds that War Axe, he's got him. Yeah, I mean, Frothing Berserker is probably one of the last legitimate threats in the deck in terms of minions. He has them both in hand now, that second Patron and the second Frothing Berserker. Grom is gone, Boom is gone, and Lotheb is gone. So that is most of the heavy hitters from the deck uh, are present and accounted for. But as you said, Orcanai on board now, so he's free to just push this three damage to face right now. I think we have established, if we're the Warrior player here, that the only way we're winning this game is hitting him in the face repeatedly. So... I don't see any world where we fight for ball control here. Yeah. For, well, Fireworks is six damage overall. Yep. Yeah. He's so got nine damage. He just needs to find two somewhere. If he had Bluegill Warrior in the deck, <laughs> could really make the cut. Is there really nothing? Like, how many how many times have you guys been in this situation where you fight for a for a final and you are just in this really bad matchup? All the time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Every day. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Every other tournament. Like, I mean. Sometimes you just get yourself in bad situations, and uh, it's really important that you can figure out a way to win. You just always look at the board, and you're like, what is the only out I have? What is my 1%? And then you really got to dig deep to try and find it. You should never give up, right? Like Because yeah. there's always a chance that Ness will um, accidentally heal his face and deal damage to himself. 
something like that, I guess. This is a stressful situation. There's oh, armor smith though, going out there. But yeah, I think this I think this line ends up being totally fine. He had to find an all-in somewhere, and his decision was just to play every minion he had, hope something stuck to the board, and then if something sticks to the board, that thing sticking to the board plus a fiery war axe drawer is potentially lethal but unfortunately the circle of healing is a present and counted for to just sweep this board out and uh, Ness is looks like he's even going to dirtle around reducing the armor before he goes ahead and circles the board which is um, kind of ambitious but sure why not yeah and uh, that's going to be it I think yeah. what does Kalman have left he's got a war axe he got a war axe war axe and an execute all right, Gold Monkey goes into the deck and out comes a wild Pyromancer, sure. So Ness can develop some minions of his choosing onto the board here if he'd like, but I think this has just been won through attrition at this point. Camlin's deck is just out of threats. Whirlwind and Execute in hand, not going to get the job done. Only three cards left. I what don't cards? think there's anything relevant in there. One of the cards is Fiery War Axe, as you said, Nim. One Inner Rage? I possibly? think an Inner Rage, yeah. And what with the, f the third card, what do you guys think? I mean, the patron list isn't 100% consistent, right? So it's hard yeah. to say with any certainty. Shredder, maybe? Yeah, it could be a second Shredder. I no, think I think we've seen two. We've seen two? Seen two? I think okay. we've seen two. Uh, well, whatever that is, that should not help in this situation. Unless he runs Ragnaros. But Ragnaros would be good. Ragnaros would Couple be of good. Turns before. I mean, Priest is almost at fatigue here. Like, Ragnaros gets a, fa a face shot in. The War Axe gets a few shots in. Fatigue starts setting in. Yeah, possibly. There's a chance. I think I've seen Ragnaros once. There's that War X. I just need to face and hope that Ragnaros is one of the last two cards you have. Yeah, just hopefully you teched it in while you were sleeping or something, when you were sleep hearth stoning. And then you get DQ'd for changing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even that win condition turns out not to be a win condition. But imagine the yeah. satisfaction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, the flash heal comes down. Yeah, I mean, I like this from Ness overall. Just War Axe to face sets up some sort of thing. Maybe Corcron Elite as a card in there, and it's potentially setting things up. So just maxing out on healing here, just in case the last three cards are like Corcron, Ar Corcron Elite in a Rage Cruel Taskmaster. There is a Cruel Taskmaster. You can clear the board and get residual damage with that 2-2. Two -two. <laughs> Kamlan concedes, and Ness advancing to the final. He will face Dog, and we have the UK representative. Right, and you can hear the noise in the crowd here. This is one of the great things. I mean, I'm personally happy because I love to see a UK guy in the final of a UK tournament, but this is something that I experienced in my first major at Gfinity as well, is like when you're in your home country performing, the crowd want to have the story of the, the home guy doing well, and you, you heard the noise come out there. They, the crowd went nuts, just clapping and cheering for Ness as he came off stage here. So he's going to go into grand finals. His, his job is done here. He's still continuing his crown as the king of insomnia. Two top eight, well, two grand finals now and a top eight in the last three insomnias. That's crazy stuff. Absolutely. And I, I have to ask Firebat, how does it feel to win on your home grounds? Especially if it's a world championship. Oh, yeah. It definitely feels good to win anytime. Like, I don't know. It's... Uh... Is it different? Like, because... Um... For European countries, I think it really uh, you, you can feel national pride when, right. you, when you win a tournament. Yeah. Uh, have you felt national pride when you won the World Championship, or was it just like big, a very big tournament for you? It was just a very big tournament for me. I feel national pride when I win in European tournaments, because like for this tournament, me and Dog were the only North American players. Zelay, right? Uh, and Zelay, yeah. Zelay. Sorry, I forgot one. <laughs> so, I mean, like what I'm saying is like there's not very many. Yeah. So it's like. Yeah. We're all, we all group together and we all hang out and stuff, and we're all like trying to take on all of Europe. Is what it feels like. So. And not to attribute from Ness's being on his home turf, but Dog coming from all the way from North America here, being one of the only three North American players, there's a story there too as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And he did have to fight versus you in the first round. Yeah. That eliminates Zale in the, in the top four, was it? Yeah. No, he, top eight. It was first, eight, first yeah. game of top eight. Yeah, he yeah. took out all of North America. So <laughs> Dog is the remaining North American person left. He has the hopes of the whole continent on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of weight to carry. And then... Uh, we got the Brit guy, so yeah. I think we need to carefully skirt around all the American Revolution jokes that are possible here <laughs> and just move on very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we actually have two more matches for, for you guys because we will have the, the grand final, um, Ness versus Dog, but we also have the second tournament, the Redemption tournament. And guys, you've been, um, Farber, you've been playing in that tournament, right? Or have you not? Uh, no, I didn't play in the Redemption tournament because I wanted to play open tournaments for much less prize pool, but they gave BlizzCon points. So I was playing the $5 open tournaments, trying to get BlizzCon points. So. Okay. 
But uh, like for me, like the Redemption Cup initiative is one of my favorite things about Insomnia, just because you you can come out here as a player, even if you're not fully confident that you're going to be hugely successful and go through. You just want to play a Hearthstone tournament. First off, it's Swiss format, so you get to play a lot of games regardless. And then after that, even if you lose, there's just a second tournament on the next day that you can still stay involved in. But that's not to say it's a casual tournament because yeah. all the pros who don't go through the Swiss are also stacked up in there as well. So there is, you know, 20 to 25 big names who didn't make it through all in that tournament. Elkie and Green Sheep, the two to make it all the way through to the final. And that'll be awesome to watch. Yep, they did make it. And uh, we will have that match lined up for you guys in just a moment. We'll prepare the players and uh, we'll be back after a short break. <laughs> 